Hey guys, it's Jess and I'm back here with another video for you. Today I have an amazing interview to share with you. So I sat down with Diana from, on Instagram, she is dream499pins and she's an amazing pin seller. I wanted to answer a couple of those common questions a lot of new pin people often have about where do pin sellers get their pins and how do they determine price along with a whole bunch of other questions. So I hope this interview is really helpful for you and let's just get into it. I know that you're a pin collector. How did you make that jump from collecting to selling? Oh goodness. Um, so actually it was kind of at the same time when pin trading started in the very beginning of 1999, I was in grad school and I was on loans and my parents weren't exactly thrilled with my new hobby. And uh, so when it ended up happening is somebody asked me, um, are you going to be here for this release coming out on a Wednesday? And I was like, oh, of course, sure, no problem. And then I see him a couple days later and he goes, what do I owe you? And I'm like, well, I look at the receipt and I'm like $8 and 50 cents. And he's like, uh, are you sure? And I'm like, well, why wouldn't I be sure? And he's all, well, it's on eBay for $50. And I'm like, Oh, okay. Why didn't I buy five of these? And, uh, and by the way, what's eBay? <laughs> so um, eBay actually started in 1998. So in 99, it was a relatively new service. And so I ended up throwing up, I would buy a couple of pins and then throw a couple up on eBay to justify my purchases. So that's kind of how it started because I mean, pin training has always been expensive. I mean, it adds up and pins right. at that period were still 10, $15 a piece. Right. Yeah, it adds up really fast and it can take you by surprise how quickly those numbers add up because <laughs> you're like, oh, it's only $15 or at this point, 17 or 25. <laughs> my sister goes through my pen book and goes, I want to look at the pretty $10 bills. <laughs> right. So that kind of answers my next question, which is how long have you been selling pens? Mm -hmm. Since 1999. Um, what was that first pen that you bought? It was a Donald Duck. Um, well, the one for my friend was a Donald mm -hmm. Duck. Pen. I don't remember exactly which Donald. It was a limited edition. I think it was a Halloween one. That's awesome. Um, yeah. So for your pen sales, how do you end up getting your pens? Oh gosh, um, any way you can possibly think of the way you would trade for pens, no different. Um, I look on eBay, I look on the Facebook groups, the Instagram feeds, I watch the live sales just as like anybody else. And I have people who contact me with collections. Um, I go to the parks and try to pick up stuff when I can as well. And anything, any, any source that anybody else who's picking up pens at, I'm using those sources as well. Do you have any go-to methods for authenticating a pen? Gosh, um, well, in the beginning, it was just a natural feel. You could just tell by being around them all the time when something was not legit. It had a lighter feel to it. It had lesser quality. The problem now is the fakes are getting better and the quality by Disney is getting worse. So there's more times than not that I've picked up a legitimate pen and I'm like, this can't be real. And it's like, yeah, this is right off the rack. And it's because the metal quality is almost, you know, tin foil. Right. So it's kind of a, a situation where it's almost difficult to tell, but, um, you know, anytime it's off in the coloring, anytime it, the metal feels off or there's sharp edges, or actually even with the real cloisonne type, you can feel like a sharp edge to it. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's not an authentic pen, but it probably means it was a scrapper that didn't make quality control and got put into the scrapper pile and then somebody sold it from that pile. So it's a lesser quality. You have, you know, two different types of pens. You have counterfeits, which are actual replicas of pens being made. And then you have the scrappers, which didn't meet quality control. So the quality control ones, you kind of can jump out at you because you can tell and you can feel it and then whatever. The replicas, those are the ones that are becoming really good. Right. And those are the ones coming on original cards even. And I think what they're becoming is overruns. I think the factory is print, just keeps printing when they're not supposed to. Oh, anymore. right. That would make sense. So it's become, a, it's become a challenge. I mean, I've been fooled as well. And unfortunately, the one, the number one hit is usually hidden Mickeys. Hidden yeah. Mickeys are always the ones that end up being the fake because they're so cheap to make because they don't have any layered parts. They're flat mm -hmm. and they're small amounts of metal. 
Right. I love my hidden Nikki, so. <laughs> They're fun, to, they're fun to chase after. So have you ever gotten some pins and they needed to be cleaned? I distinctly remember one live sale where you told the Bryans that you put them in the dishwasher as a joke, <laughs> but seriously, how do you clean your pins? Um, well, depending on what kind of metal they are, the first, um, as long as it's not an enamel where it's a enamel painted on where you, you can almost feel or scuff it off with your fingernail, Mm -hmm. The first method I use is a, a pencil eraser. Pencil oh, really? erasers are great for getting rid of anything on a metal shiny. It, it helps with the shininess factor. It helps get rid of rust. Um, the tarnish is often gotten rid of with a pencil eraser. But that would be my first thing because that is not really that abrasive. You can kind of tell that it's it's working or not working. Um, after that, I've used rubbing alcohol. I've used a uh, nail polish remover. Um, the other one is, um, what was the other one I've used? Oh, um, when it comes to free D, the bleach pens that you use for Clorox. Oh, you can use that on the free D rubber sections. So that if you have a, a spot idea. that's kind of dirty and you just kind of use it and it whitens it up. So. That's awesome. Is there any products that you don't recommend people use on their pens? um test it on something before you know or try, try to do it in a spot that's not as conspicuous i mean if you're having to clean it up or, or do all that already um you know know that your worst case scenario is you have the same scenario as you did before you have right. still a messy pen or a dirty pen so you know it's it's just just try to be gentle with it if it's not working or the paint starts to be coming off um obviously that's too strong so and that's right. what the nail, the nail polish remover is the most risky Right. How do you go about figuring out the price for a pen? Oh gosh, that's kind of a kind of a weird one. Um, it's really difficult when it comes to pens that are really low edition sizes. Like I just put mm -hmm. up an LE15 frame set pen of Maleficent. I put it up on eBay. Oh my gosh. And sometimes it's one of those where you go high thinking, okay, at least people know I have it, and then they can talk to me and make it go down. You know, you start higher and then you're like, because you can always go down in a price. It's always a bummer when you're like, oh, I made this $50. It's like, oh, well, it was worth $350. Oh, great. Um, so, you know, it's one of those where I usually try a little bit higher than what I think it's really should be valued at. But some things just are impossible to even market or figure out what they're worth. And truly, pen trading is based on what somebody's willing to pay. So that's basically the number one thing. Um, just like everybody else, I look at closed eBay listings. I look at other, you know, sales that I saw on Facebook or that kind of thing. Um, the website Worth Point is very good for archived material. Worth Point is great because it has pictures of auctions from over 10 years ago. And oh, sometimes awesome. it's really cool just to see the old frames or the old Disney auction stuff. And you're like, wow, that, that pin's now going for $3,000 and it was only $150 back in 10 years ago. And so, so I, I really, I'm a big fan of Worth Point for that reason. I, I'm very visual, so. Right. How much time do you spend preparing for a sale and what goes into that prep work? Well, it's kind of a twofold because I'm never not looking for pins. So I'm always scouting out, but I was doing that before I even did live sales. I was always looking for, I mean, to me, this is a hobby. It's a, it's a labor of love. I love looking and scouting out. My whole thing is treasure hunting. I am, I want the weirdest, wackiest thing I've never seen before. And I have to have it because I've never had it before. So the scouting part never stops. Uh, the actual prep for the live sale is probably um, roughly a day and a half where I prepare the boards that are that we do for the, uh, the pins on boards that we show. And then I have all the individual pricing. And I like to look up a little bit more information than just a price point. I like to know the year. I like to know the event. Um, I like to know, you know, double check if it's something that has significance to it that I can share with the audience. Because I, I like to be known for giving a little bit more history involved with my pins than just, uh, well, here's Madam Mim. Okay, where is this from? How, you know, are we talking a decades old pen? Are we talking a brand new pen? Are we talking, is it from an event? Why, what makes this mem special? So I kind of look them up and I look up on Penpix. Penpix being somewhat reliable. I mean, it's got its flaws, but it's the main database we have. 
Um, but I do like to prep in advance. So that in itself, it's about a day, day and a half pro process. So. Yeah, I a lot of the information I know about pins has came actually from your live sales oh, because you're great. so informative in them. <laughs> Can you tell us how an actual sale works? Because I know you have lots of people helping you in the background and how exactly does the, the behind the scenes of a sale work? Well, um, imagine a room with a C-shaped uh, set of tables. Um, the tripod faces forward and that's where, you know, what you do see is what's in front of you. But to my right are my pin boards and my buckets of pins that I'm going to show. And then behind me are my helpers. We have one that's writing out envelopes that is for each of the people that would like to buy something. And so she writes it out and we have that already behind me. And so I have two people behind me. One does envelopes, the other one puts the items in the envelopes after they've been written. So I hand it over, it's usually Stuart and Jeanette have been my, my two go-tos these lately, lately and they've been fabulous. But um, I normally hand it to Stuart. Stuart puts it in the envelope that's already been pre-written. That being said, because he, he has terrible handwriting. Uh, <laughs> so Jeanette's been fabulous. She writes out each name every single time. But when you get to the longer part of the show, after you've done about two hours, a lot of people have already bought. So you don't have to keep writing envelopes the entire time. You know, one, one time, one person, it's good. And a lot of people buy more than just one pen. So it goes a lot faster that way. But I mean, I constantly, I show a pin and then I'm handing it over to them in the side. But it says sold. If it's not sold, it goes into back into the bucket. Right. So I know like this fast paced and I'm very big about, you know, let's just keep moving on because there's already a lot, a lag. Um, you know, the people have already right sold. I'm not going to see it for a minute or two. So how long do you really show this pen? So I'm really big about, okay, let's, you know, give us a few seconds, give it a little bit of a story. Okay. Next pen. And so, and then it goes back to people already said it's sold. You've got to catch up a little bit, but it's a little manic. I'm kind of, I kind of feel like an octopus. Uh, there's a, this whole this whole thing going on here with the hands and the, and the, all that during the sale that you don't see, thank goodness. But um, it, it, it's a good organized chaos. Uh, but yeah, we've got our guys, system down. We've you guys seem very smooth when it comes to watching, and I appreciate how fast things move, and you don't have to sit there and wait for forever to get on to the next thing, because yeah. a lot of times, like you said, it does sell really fast, and then. If you're there waiting for them to move on to the next pen, you're just like, okay. <laughs> How did you come up with all the different games you play during your live sales? <laughs> Trial and error. <laughs> We've tried so many different games and so many different things and just, just coming up with different stuff. Like we just came up with a, well, two years ago, we did the, how many pins are in a jar? Oh yeah, I love that. To, you know, when you go into a restaurant, how many beans are in here to guess or that kind of thing. And I felt that it was a lot of fun to see how many I could cram into that jar and then they could win the jar full of pins because who doesn't want a jar full of pins even if it's nothing you need? I mean, you can always throw them on lanyards or, or something like that. Right. So um, we tried some things that didn't work. The Plinko itself is kind of a joke on itself because sometimes it doesn't work. Um, but we like that because it has its own um, hokiness to it, which we enjoy. I mean, kind of there's a little bit of anticipation and, and it's also it kind of shows that we can't possibly make this board do what we want it to. Uh, so <laughs> there's no fraud or anything like that happening with our game. It's, it's just the board being silly. The other part is people also don't realize is that in order to have it in a certain angle, it has to tilt. And so the way it tilts doesn't allow the chip all the time to go all the way down is when you really would play the game at a party. So in order not to have a glare on the screen and that kind of thing. So we've got this the silliness there. But we've tried different things. We we had our battle of the Bryans where we had the two the two crazy boys that knew nothing about Disney, which was which which was fun. It was fun asking them questions and, and embarrassing them by it. Um, which they were good sports, of course. And uh, so we've just kind of, you know, come up with stuff. Um, it's very typical for live sales to do stickers behind things, whether it's behind a package that you're buying or behind a pin board or that kind of thing. So that's pretty common. Um, I don't think anybody's really doing the Plinko. Marcy Mouse used to do it for a little bit. But everybody kind of comes up with their own ideas and tries not to copy. And there's a general respect between the sellers not to make an exact, you know, but there's certain things where, there is only so much you can do. There's only so much you can do with a live feed and how many guessing games can you have or how many trivia contests can you have that, and, and how do you make it more fun? 
So it's just kind of, like I said, it's, just, it's a trial and error. We try to have fun with it. We try to see, and then we also, you know, keep track of how many people are leaving the room the minute this game comes on. <laughs> you know, there's right. certain games that aren't popular, and so be it. We learn. I mean, it's been a, it's been a, a lesson. It's been a lot of we, a lot of trial and error with regards to uh, what works, what doesn't, what people want to see. But the fact of the matter is, is they're there for the pins, and right. show me pins, and show me games with pins, and show me prizes with pins, and that kind of just comes down to pins, pins, pins. So that's what we found that works the best. Are there any red flags people should be aware of when looking at different pin sellers? Oh gosh, that's tr that's tricky. Um, I have found that bad pins are normally in groups. Mm -hmm. When you know a pin to be a bad one, and all of a sudden that whole series is bad, or that whole you know occasionally one will slip by on a good seller that 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 I can excuse and right. see that but if you start to see like all of the teacups all of the dark tails all of the horses and all you're like wait a minute this is becoming a pattern here kind of goes with your intuition of also if all of a sudden the prices are like more than you know a third of what you're normally used to it's probably because they have 15 to 20 of them and that isn't the normal way those are released in the first place. I mean, the dark tails, you'd be happy to have maybe two. You know, you don't have 15 of a dark tails or 15 of a WDI pen very often. I mean, there, there's some small exceptions, but um, my first thing is you see them in groups. I mean, just as you watch on eBay as well, you people know the named sellers, they know the Ice Bay, they know, you know, certain ones to like Doug's pens, they, they know those people and they know to stay away from them, but you'll notice that they're in groups. You, you kind of normally it it's very rare to have a person selling legit pins and bad pins all mixed up one usually is dominant over the other so typically when you start spotting if you spot two or three it's most likely their entire lot is is probably bad stuff so it, it's just kind of you just kind of get to that gut feeling and the respected sellers you know it, it it helps having the database, the, the PSA and the warnings and, and the, and the uh, different recommendations that you can have for people. But, um, you know, it's just the more familiar you are with pin trading, the more your gut instinct comes in and says this deal is too good to be true or the too many repetitive listings of the same pen. You know, somebody has six, six LE 100s of something that that's not typical. So that's right. where the red flag would come up. So you sell pens both on eBay and on Instagram. Do you mm -hmm. prefer one method over the other? Um, they're totally different. Um, I love the in interaction I have with the buyers on Instagram. I love mm -hmm. the talking to them during the live sale. And I also like talking to them privately in the message system because it's very quick. Um, I can do it anytime on my phone and that kind of thing. eBay is not so much communication friendly. I mean, you can send messages, but there's not a chat going on. There isn't a back and forth that's very, very fast. But the good part about eBay is I use it as a showcase. I use it as instead of somebody writing, I mean, when somebody writes to me and says, hey, I collect Minnie Mouse, what do you have? And it's like, wow, um, like 800 Minnie Mouse pins. <laughs> Well, then I can say, hey, go take a look at what I have up on eBay because that's my showcase. It's far easier than having to go dig out all 800 mini mouse pins. I hopefully have at least two or 300 of them already listed that somebody can just go and take a look and see. So I use a, I use a hybrid method between the two. Um, okay. They're completely different. They're different. I mean, eBay, of course, is older than Instagram. Um, and Instagram has a whole different, it's just a totally different feel doing a live sale. Um, the live sale itself is a kind of more intense. It's it's a more intense process. eBay is much more lax where I can choose when I list and decide, you know, I, I used to list seven days a week and now I'm down to one day a week. And um, it's because the Instagram takes so much more of my time, but I also have much more popularity on the Instagram as I do than I do on the eBay. So it's kind of it's kind of, they're different for different reasons. And I, I like eBay, but unfortunately they also are going up in their fees. So it makes selling a little harder um, when you've got a 15% commission going to them. I mean, I understand they have to survive too, but it makes other places much more appealing such as Facebook, such as Instagram. So, so there's that kind of situation as well. How has the pandemic affected your pen sales? Oh gosh, um, well, it's interesting. Um, we have gone up in our sales. Oh. 
we have more people buying because I think they're stuck at home and they're bored and with nothing to do. In the very beginning of COVID, um, the live sales were so popular because we were something to do on a Sunday night. And it was something to watch. It was something fun. And people were all about doing online buys. The online purchasing was huge. I mean, there were all these articles about Amazon being at its top ever. And I mean, it just people were just bored. And so they were buying things for their collections and that kind of thing. The interesting part is that COVID affected us in trying to find pins. Finding pins was actually much more difficult because you couldn't go to the park and the park didn't have any limited editions released anywhere in the very beginning. That's We didn't have Shop Disney doing anything and it took at least a couple months before they started doing the park stuff. So it became one of these perfect storms of nobody was selling their pins and your only resource was basically eBay and waiting for a collection to maybe pop up, but the finances weren't hurt, hurt that bad in the very beginning of COVID. It was mostly a boredom factor. And so our sales went through the roof. And then we hit a point where um, our inventory disappeared. It was kind of how to replenish that became, became the, the, the struggle. And, uh, but now it's kind of gone back to a normal pace I think with the holidays, and then you unfortunately have all those layoffs that happened. Right. Uh, we're starting to see some people with the collections coming out and selling things and that kind of thing. But um, I don't think we've had a huge hit on the economy yet to see a lot of that happening. But the sales themselves, I mean, I think people in general can always spend 20 bucks. I mean, there's kind of that, and, and I like that marketplace because it's not going to tax you too, hopefully too much by doing the one $20 pen and that kind of thing. And that's kind of where my market has always been in that 20 to $50 range. Because uh, you don't see, you know, who buys thousand dollar pins every week? I mean, it just doesn't happen. I mean, they exist and they're, and they're out there, but um, it doesn't happen. It doesn't happen that often. So I focus on the lower, the lower dollar value. So kind of going with that, what's the most memorable pin you've ever had in a sale? Memorable? There's so many, actually. We've had, I mean, we've had the Gomes pins. We've had the thousand dollar, you know, cast exclusive, you know, I mean, cast jumbo Disney auctions pins and that kind of thing. But I actually was most happy to show off a old vintage 1956 submarine badge from Disneyland. And so for me, it was the history and it was all, I got, to, I got to geek out and be the nerd that I love to be and got to show that. And it actually, it wasn't for sale. It was more just a show off piece. It was actually a private sale to somebody because person collected only vintage and, and that, it's a very elite market. But to also just show that there are different clicks and methods and different ways to collect than just the, the one normal pin that you see that's enamel. And so to me, that was just really special and unique. And so I just kind of like to show those kind of things off because it's just so many pin traders don't even know what's out there and it's an education basis, but it's also um, educating them on this is what this is. And so that was a lot of fun in regards to that. So that's the one that comes to mind the most because I also almost cried giving it up. <laughs> it, was, it was such a beautiful piece. I mean, how often do you find a costume badge from 1956? Right. I mean, so it, it was incredible. So that was one of the ones that definitely, definitely comes to mind. So I know that you have a huge Tigger collection. Do you know how many pins you have in your Tiggers? Um, no, I stopped counting. <laughs> counting, <laughs> counting the collection is never a good thing. Um, right. and, and, and the joke is, is that anytime I have extra pins or, or starting something that looks like a collection, no, no, it's inventory. Um, so, so there is a whole mixture of um, my collection versus the inventory. Now, the collection will never see the light of day ever. I will be buried with my collection. And <laughs> it, that's just a fact. It's, it's been such a lifelong, lifelong habit. Habit, Because um, I collected before Disney pin trading started, the My Tigger pins. Oh. So when I was a kid, everybody would go to Disneyland and pick up a Tigger pen for me. And so I had this little baggie full of Tigger pens from the 1980s, which is how I ended up starting. So the idea of ever even parting with one Tigger pen is just, I can't do it. So, um, so the collection itself is probably, I mean, if I did a rough estimate on what's in it right now, it's close to 3,000 pen, 3, pens with Tigger. That's amazing. Yeah, I, but but I also go even overboard. I mean, I, I've, I've explained to this people on my live sales even, I'll even get the scrappers. 
because they're a different color than the original pen. And so to me, that's a unique and different pen. I've got the fantasy, I go for the APs, I go for the PPs, the prototypes. I mean, you name it, if it's got a stripey character on there, it's mine. <laughs> so it's gotta be in the collection. So it, it's just, but I also, um, I also had only a limited amount I could get. So I had to get more creative in the collecting of it. So, because Tigger pins only come out no more than five or 10 times a year. And so it's not a character they do a lot of. So I had to make this a broader thing because I needed something to collect. I, I needed reason to scout out the books, not just for, you know, looking for my sales or that kind of thing. It's a, it goes back to, I mean, I take such pride in being a completist now that it's, uh, I'm, I'm doing the happy dance still. So, um, but I did have some other little things I collected, not just the Tiggers for, for a while there. So, so that, that's now quote the inventory. <laughs> Got it. I totally get that. I, um, my big collection is Sword in the Stone. I don't know if you yep. can see it back here, which all of those came from you. <laughs> oh my goodness. That's excellent. That's excellent. Do you have the whole set there of the WDI ones? Yes. That's awesome. And Was the there... center is a um, fantasy pen that is actually them at the dueling, That's like their stamps back to back. I love that. That's so great. Those are great sized pens too. Oh, I know. They were amazing. And opening them was so fun. Mm -hmm. Very much so. Can you show us your favorite Tigger pen? Is it well, I have, I, okay, that's almost like picking between my children. So, um, so I, I have one that is one of my favorites. This one right here. This is Tigger dressed as Teddy Roosevelt. And he's got, he's on a hobby horse and he has a Winnie the Pooh with him. And the reason he is my favorite well, uh, one of my favorites, and actually I'm looking for the prototype of this, this set, um, is that I was a U.S. history major. And so oh. the fact that it has Teddy Roosevelt with the teddy bear with him, because that's what they nicknamed the teddy bear when he was in office. So the fact that he's got the hobby horse and doing the whole historical thing, it's like there's multi-levels to the pen. It's not just here's a Tigger looking cute. Um, I, I just kind of, it resonates with me on that. I love the little extra details of it with the teddy bear and of course it's Pooh. But um, so that's the one that I actually, my grail is to find those in prototype. And then I will have everything in prototype that's patriotic or history related with Winnie the Pooh, with Tigger. So, wow. But so that's one of my, one of my favorites. But uh, Again, it's hard to pick. I mean, I go through, you know, it's Halloween. So right now I'm happy to have the, the, the there's a Tigger dressed as a little devil and he's got such an ornery little look on him. So he makes me happy right now. And then, you know, it's like, it's seasonal, it's seasonal. So it's kind of, and I try I to think, show off some of those frames. I think we see a lot of him in the fall, like around um, Halloween, it feels like. They do a lot of Winnie the Pooh Halloween pens. Yeah, they seem to they seem to at least put them on one for the season so thank you so that's pretty much all the questions i have outside of how can people find you well uh, i can be found on instagram every sunday night we do our live sale from 3 30 until 7 30 pacific standard time that's disneyland time because we're in california and uh, we normally don't take a day off so we usually are there every sunday and then I'm also on eBay as Dream 499. And uh, so Dream and the numbers 499. Um, crazy little story back there too, but <laughs> it's a whole nother, whole nother day for another day. But uh, that's how you can find me. And I'm always open to people's questions. I'm happy to help and direct people in the right way. I, I love talking to new traders. I'm not, you know, one of those who feels it's a waste of time. I really do love educating people on, you know, the goods and the, the ins and the outs and, and, leading people to at least uh, not to go too crazy or bankrupt in that first month of pin trading. So, which often happens with somebody who's so enthusiastic about it. So kind of right. get them to calm down just a little bit. You got to pick just two characters. <laughs> so, right, don't collect everything. You know, things with pointy backs just is, does not work. It, it, <laughs> it's, too, it's too broad. All right. I hope that was helpful. And I love Diana's pens. I mean, she has amazing pens that she gets. And a lot of my grails have actually come from her. So I hope you check her out. Like she said, she's, she has Sunday afternoon slash evening sales, depending on which 
time slot you're in. I'm going to go ahead and link her down below so you can find her both on eBay as well as on Instagram to catch those sales. So I hope you guys go and check her out and see what she has. Maybe she has something that'll fit in your collection. And don't forget that she also does these pin boards throughout the week on her Instagram that'll have the lower priced pins, usually things under $25. And then on her live sale, on her live sale, she does the more expensive pens, usually starting at $25 and going up. So just so you know what to expect, because a lot of her pins are of a higher quality and so they do cost a little bit more, but not all of them. Like she does have cheaper options for people. And I know that in the past she has combined orders for me. Like I found something on eBay that I want to get and I've been able to message her and say, hey, can I combine this pen with my live sale order? And she's happy to do that. It saves her a little bit on the eBay fees that way. And it just, it works out for both of us. So just keep that in mind. All right, that's all I have for today. And I hope you guys enjoyed that interview. And until next time, have an absolutely fantastic day. Bye guys.